Good morning. Uh, I'm Sharon King. Uh, welcome to the UCLA Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies Conference on Law and Disorder, Fools, Outlaws, and Justice in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, Day 2. We are going to be hearing from Professor Joel Ingram, who is an associate professor at Ohio University, where she teaches Renaissance literature in the English department. She's the author of Idioms of Self-Interest, Credit, Identity, and Property in English Renaissance Literature. She's editor of the new Kittredge edition of Shakespeare's Love's, Labor Lo Love's Labor's Lost, and author of Festive Enterprise, The Business of Drama in Medieval and Renaissance England, which is just coming out now, or just came out, I believe. She is also contributing a digital scholarly edition of Thomas Haywood's Lord's, Lord's Mayor's show, Londini Emporia, I haven't read that, oh, to the map of uh, early modern London project. And her uh, presentation today is titled Complicity with the Vice, Spectatorship of Crime in Late Medieval and Early Modern English Drama. Okay, thank you, Sharon. And thank you for having me here at this wonderful conference at the center and the, uh, the really great entertainment in the play No Fooling with Justice that of course I was not familiar with. Um, and uh, I too loved the, the Mel Brooks vibe. I thought it, and I compared also to the big Lebowski, so justice, <laughs> go Dame Justice. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, my paper today uh, draws upon research into money gathering, actually, um, as an early form of funding performances at medieval festi festive events, such as church ales, summer fairs, and Christmas plays. Um, and I was seeing that the money gatherers were often vice characters or thieves, such as Robin Hood. And I found versions of those characters in later early modern plays on the public stages in London. So my talk will explore the persistence and acceptance of the criminal or of a type of crime and theorize why and how audiences are drawn into criminal activities that such ca characters perform on the stage. So I'm drawing from a chapter of, of my new book, which I shamelessly held up that familiar Betley window, right? <laughs> um, my new book, Festive Enterprise, The Business of Drama in Medieval and Renaissance England out last month with Notre Dame. Um, but it wasn't a book when I was first invited to talk. It was just a collection of ideas and you know, it's some chapters. And so I apologize for reading material that um, I guess Max mentioned the same thing yesterday, but I apologize for reading material that's now actually in print. Um, but I'm beginning mid-chapter after a section on how fundraising figured at festive events and, um, and how figures were eliciting money from spectators at those events. So um, I'm picking up from that point. When electing to become donors, audiences made the legitimate, made the illegitimate legitimate. The proof we have of this decision is in the popularity of such characters themselves measured in shillings and pence gathered at festive events from the 14th through the 16th centuries. Festive organizers were not the only ones to recognize the usefulness of such paradoxical gathers. Late medieval playing companies and playwrights saw in the complex figure something attractive too, for they used versions of it to draw audiences to their plays. I'm talking the figure, I mean this gather figure. Whatever its incarnation, a roguish thief, a satanic entertainer, or a flashy seducer, the figure clearly involved audiences in its conflicts, tempting them to make the conflicts their own. The way in which this was achieved is a testament to the artistry of the religious plays of the late Middle Ages. Late medieval audiences were confronted with the decision to legitimize the otherwise illegitimate performer most intimately during the house visit, the house visit. In 1478, Saint, the St. Catherine's players visited the homes of Bristol's mayor, sheriff, and other civic officials during the St. Catherine's Day Festival. Appearing unannounced and unsolicited, players expected drink and payment to reward their entertainment. Sometimes termed a cat, the house visit entertained inhabitants as an excuse to extract largesse at the end of the performance. To position the cat in relation to other gathering methods, we can employ Thomas Pettit's taxonomy of encounter customs, and that's his phrase, encounter customs. 
Pettit places festive customary interactions on a spectrum from threatening to beneficent. The cat typically lies on the hostile end, though aggression was more theatrical than real. The cat could be dramatized on stage too, as it was in the 17th century boot and spur, a burlesque holiday shoemaker's apprentice's entertainment. Following a folk hero combat formula that included boasting, combat, and the cure, it concluded with the festive largesse exaction. And he would collect money from the audience saying, you will pay me well. So this assertive phrase, you will pay me well, reinforces the play's combative theme and its suggestion of a threat. At the same time, the actor invited the spectator into the fiction of the play to judge the fictional character's skills. By doing so, he drew the audience into the narrative presentation of the play. The cat as an exaction encounter did not begin with boot and spur, as we know from familiar examples such as the early Tudor interlude Mankind. In that play, a collection is taken as a precondition for the entry of the devil figure to the villas. The clown or minor vice, New Guys, addresses the audience directly, announcing, we intend to gather money if it pleased your negligence for a man with a head that is of great omnipotence. To the villas's omnipotence is evident from his large head or mask, a visible jest suggesting his paradoxical power in the impending money gathering ritual. Audiences must decide how to interpret the laughable figure whose command, who commands space nonetheless. The play encourages identification with the gathering vices. Sympathy shifts towards the three N when Titavillis demands the money. Even more importantly, the boundary between audience and actor is broken when the three N invite the audience to join them in their singing later. And again, when Titavillis confides in the audience by asking them not to warn mankind of his, of his plans, promising the audience a pretty game in return. There's no real suggestion that audiences will ultimate, ultimately be seduced as a larger mes message is to resist the power of vices and the devil, to join in the social effect of the sacraments and to seek mercy through penance. The Shrove Tide liturgy is to be followed and the minor vices abuse toward mercy is to be repelled in the interest of restoration of sacramental community. Yet to Davilis and the three ends invitations offer spectators a momentary participation in the playmaking. Playgoers enter the play's world in a number of ways, as singers, as characters keeping secrets from mankind, and as playwrights approving to the Villas' pretty game. If spectators had resisted the vice's evil up until this point, that resistance was likely penetrated as they assumed these roles. The audience member's social proximity to the vice, so explicit in mankind, is made implicit in other plays. This happened frequently in smaller playing companies when doubling of characters was necessary. In such cases, the two characters attributes could become conflated. A prologue could double as the vice who also served as a gatherer. And this is likely the case for Lewis Wager's The Life and Repentance of Mary Magdalene, a Protestant rewriting of that saint's play. The vice character who tempts Mary as infidelity would likely also play the prologue who performs a gathering function. The prologue exhorts, Truly, I say, whether you give hay pence or pence, your gain shall be double before you depart hence. Is wisdom no more worth than a penny, troll you? The prologue sales pitch, hawking better wisdom for a higher fee, likely indicates a double scale of admission, and it suits the pushiness of the vice. To see prologue as gatherer, as a vice, would have encouraged viewers to draw parallels between the characters. In mankind, doubling sometimes resulted in one actor playing the opposite roles of Mercy and Titavillis. The ambivalence produced by such doubling encourages the audience to glimpse the metamorphic power of their own minds in Anthony Gash's words. Given this agentive role, spectators collaborated in playmaking with the vice gather, and that's sort of my invention, the vice gather as a name of a figure. The reciprocal nature of this audience character interaction depended on the close, almost private messages from vice to spectator. This sometimes appears as a warning that audience members might be the victim of theft. Gossipy, yet exclusive at the same time, the warning putatively comes from a knowledgeable source, the vice himself. To return to mankind, when Titavillas first enters the play, he warns viewers to keep a close eye on their horses outside. Ye that have good horse, are you to say caveatus? It is unclear where is he, whether he is merely aware of potential thieves, has directed their activity himself, or if he intends to do the stealing. 
As in subsequent criminal and rogue literature, such as Thomas Harmon's A Caveat for Common Cursitors, Tisavillis's warning illuminates criminal tricks and byways for naive victims. Another example occurs in John Haywood's The Play of the Weather, where Mary Report, the vice, confesses his plotting nature to the audience in direct address. Friends of fellowship, let me go by ye. Think I might stand thrusting among you there? Nay, by God, I must thrust about other gear. Mary reports grouchy verbal jostle was likely delivered with an actual shove to gather gathered standing audience members at the screen's end of a great hall performance space. Brusque as it is, his intimation of subsequent abuse or gear is concomitantly an invitation. Listeners will benefit from his knowledge. His position in the play underlines this since Mary Port serves as an attendant to the god Jupiter in a court where Jupiter hears claimants who plead for the best type of weather to suit their needs. As a go-between for access to Jupiter, Mary Report shares qualities with the playwright himself. Haywood, both an actor and a musician, served as a sewer of the king's chamber to Henry VIII. Nowhere does Haywood explicitly draw the parallel, but he may have been recognized as a model for Mary Report. He may also have played the part himself, attaching even more significance to the character. Such observations should not downplay the ultimate moral antipathy audience members are meant to have for the vice in medieval drama, yet in moments such as these, spectators receive privileged information, even when that information is telegraphed with an evil intent. The informants, Mary Report or Titavillis, serve as ambassadors to the audience. Such information primarily occurs in direct address where spectators receive most keenly the invitation to collaborate. Critics treating direct address do not typically note its power to draw spectators into the play's narrative fiction. Most frequently, in fact, direct address is said to distance spectators from it in ironic detachment. Direct address in this view highlights a sense of the play's artificiality. Robert Weimann explains this function in linking the stage fool who directly addresses the audience with its prototype in the popular tradition, a character whose ceremonial function requires that he serve the community occasion. Weimann says that he, quote, stands apart from the play itself and occupies the positions of parodist, organizer, and collector, unquote. Bauman's claim that the character stands apart from the play represents a critical consensus that direct address is an extra dramatic element or one that occurs outside the play's fictional construct. At times that may accurately describe the theatrical effect, but I wish to account for the degree to which such moments claim the audience's attention by drawing them into the scene. Critics who admit this possibility locate its stimulus in personal and local references in household drama where spectators and performers share a hermeneutic circle of messages. Yet critical attention to the personal dimension in which patron involvement is defined by their pre-established relation to performers sometimes overlooks ways in which audience investment is directed dramaturgically or in patterns established formally. Direct address provides an appropriate place to think about the unlikely intimacy between criminal characters and their audiences, precisely because it is so unlikely. Where no personal connection exists, what motivates viewers to identify with malefactors? When moments of, direct, a direct, when moments of direct address are used to announce a crime, the gathering function goes underground, so to speak. Characters are not asking for money, in other words, they are just taking it. They confide their theft, however, while simultaneously inviting audience members to be aware of it. In such scenes, they invite collaboration, thus retaining a participatory mood. The theatrical endeavor is a joint project. Thomas Preston's Cambyses provides a straightforward example. Ambidexter, the outrageously costumed vice, connects with the audience in a series of whimsical moments of direct address. He alerts them to his cousin, Cutpurse, who lurks among them in the audience. Halfway through the play, he emerges and says, but is my, not my cousin Cutpurse with you in the meantime? To it, to it, cousin, and do your office fine. Goading and spurring on a fictional thief in the audience, Ambidexter jokes that a confederate of his is picking their pockets. In confiding this shift, he invites complicit approval of a thief's activity, even suggests it is admirable. Such rhetorical double dealing draws audience approval, partly owing to their intellectual sophistication. Aware of Ciceronian models of rhetorical argument that some vice characters employ, learned patrons enjoy the destabilizing and dissonant power of such moments. 
Some critics alternately locate audience approval not in intellectual, but instead in an emotional register where spectators' reaction oscillate between sympathy with and aversion to disreputable characters. But whether emotional or more cognitive, audience response requires cues that induce such reactions. So mining the poetics of the plays reveals how form supports the complicity the vice enables. One way characters elicit an emotional audience response is by using the confession of crime to stand closer to the listener, both morally and physically. <clears throat> Playwrights gave vice characters time alone with the audience. Nicholas Newfangle, the vice in Fulwell's Like Will to Like, is emblematic of the rhetorical double dealing that enjoins complicity through private address. First using direct address to assert his relation to the devil, who enters silently onto the stage, Newfangle introduces the audience to his godfather, Lucifer. Stage directions stipulate that other characters leave the stage so that Newfangle can address the audience alone. This first signals complicity. When he let later peddles wares while asserting that all who sell merchandise are not to be trusted, he confesses to the audience his dishonesty. The humorously odd union of transparency and deceit <clears throat> ultimately demolishes Lucifer's diabolical powers by offering the listener the truth. By essentially instructing the audience not to believe him, the evil character becomes ridiculous. Such characters embody an ambivalence toward rhetoric used to encourage corruption. The effect is evident even in plays illuminating corrupt economic practices such as rent racking, as in the moral interludes of the mid to late 16th century, like Walpole's The Tide Tarrieth No Man and Thomas Lupton's All for Money. In those plays, voicing Protestant calls for reform, the vice figure induces various social types into acts of corruption and deceit, such as luring courtiers to borrow excessively. Constant direct address characterizes Courage the Vice in The Tide Tarrieth No Man, who directs the audience activities of the various tempters, such as greediness the merchant, hurtful help, and no good neighborhood. Near the play's conclusion, Courage and invite spectators to collaborate in his escape from authority saying, but hush, somebody is coming this way. Subsequently apprehended and hauled off to jail, courage perhaps seems more pitiable for his disclosure. If nothing else, the spectator momentarily cast in the diegesis shares a moment of quiet complicity as courage attempts to elude authority. Yet to describe an audience's sense of complicity with evil characters and calling the vice empathetic seems a far reach. Knowing that some patrons appreciated subversive Ciceronian rhetoric or enjoyed the humor linking deception with transparency does not go all the way toward explaining why audiences might approve of Nicholas Newfangle, the godson of Satan, or ambidexter telling his cousin to pick their pockets or Mary reports gear. It is counter counterintuitive to identify with evil in plays rooted in the morality tradition, one whose plots that ultimately directed listeners to make sacramentally informed choices leading to their soul's health. Viewers did not divorce themselves entirely from ethical and moral judgment while enjoying moments of identification with nefarious characters, and yet the narrative shape of the plays directed them to suspend that judgment momentarily. Drama locates its energy in the seducer's performance, and devils are seducers in these plays. When invited into the play's fictions, audience members become quasi-dramatic characters. They enter the play's drama and its concerns, if only temporarily. In what Maura Giles Watson calls a dual referential and performative semiosis, the audience knows that ambidexter, for example, is only referring to a fictional pickpocket. But as they, as they themselves engage with ambidexter, they find complicity with his knowledge of it. They know too and are in on the secret. In such moments, audience members indulge character choices as a result of their proximity to them. Critics interested in spectatorship have pointed to societal changes outside the drama as the source of audience response. Even those critics who attend more closely to affect and cognitive theory look beyond the text themselves, seeing evidence in medical discourse or spatial dynamics to explain spectator reaction. In examining spectator complicity, I draw attention back to the play text. So I'm less concerned with affect and more focused on the poetics of dramatic form that constitute the cues for audience response. Elements of the gatherer function in play texts themselves reveal traces of the community-based festive events that characterize the age. Such an investigation, finding the festive gatherer as it comes to the indoor stage, takes one large step towards bridging the medieval Renaissance scholarly divide. 
in order to glean the character's role in ushering medieval participants to their early modern seats and to better understand how spectators might have valued the character's role in that transition, we need a better theoretical lens through which to view that valuation. So one way to appreciate spectators' complicity with the vice is to recognize how the vice's interests become the audience members. It is what the French dramatist Pierre Cornet theorized as indulgence of a character. In examining how audience relation to characters affects their engagement with the play, he claimed that audience sympathy directs them to tolerate concessions to immoral actions on stage. Morally questionable characters can elicit a wonder that Cornet says is not equivalent to moral esteem. We embrace the villain's interest because we want to experience the vicarious pleasure of watching a favored character triumph. Yet the only way to do that is to adopt temporarily the character's own warped perspective. The feeling is impermanent because the play holds the implicit promise that antipathetic characters will be punished. Cornet treats Roman plays in his critical efforts to refine and build on Aristotelian theories of catharsis, but his analysis no less applies to the English dramatic tradition, especially if we nudge Cornet's theories away from the Aristotelian. To do so, I draw on Anthony Gash, who, is an, who in his analysis of carnivalesque aesthetics challenges Aristotelian principles that privilege plot elements such as resolution. Gash uses the term wonder to describe the audience experience of theatrical paradox, where levels of sign and meaning interact to produce the experience. Paradox is created when multiple levels signify simultaneously, like actual actors coming and going on stage with fictional characters, conflicts with and allegorical meanings. Such paradoxes describe the situation near the conclusion of Twelfth Night, for example. Malvolio is understood as a steward held in a makeshift cell but also as a disembodied spirit in purgatory. He is deceived by the clown Festi, who is play acting a priest, whom the audience might also envision on an allegorical level as a demon. Gash sees such paradoxical moments as an invitation for audience, audiences to interpret what is present to their eyes as a symbol of a higher order of experience than either the senses or the Aristotelian logic of non-contradiction can attain." Unquote. Gash's sense that audiences are invited to interpret contradictory theatrical signs might fruitfully be joined to Cornet's abiding interest in evil characters. Spectators see vices as empathetic when vices transfer private information, even when such messages presage knavery. Drawn into a paradoxical urge to profit the knave, engaged spectators do so implicitly by virtue of their spectatorship. Engagement with such characters develops slowly during over a century or more when money gathering rituals employed vice-like characters such as Morris dancers and thieving Robin Hoods to direct audience interest. A simultaneous medieval dra dramatic tradition of bringing such characters indoors may have reminded viewers of their indulgence of similar characters in festive settings. The jesting vice gatherer, even when not maintaining his gathering function, already had the audience's ear and eye. It was no surprise then for a patron to enjoy a thrilling proximity to such malefactors or to share in a moment of sympathetic laughter. The agency that audience members felt when giving the criminals illegitimate actions theatrical legitimacy was the same agency they had when paying gatherers. The prevalence of the vice gather on the late medieval stage suggested the decision to distinguish fictional representation of crime from actual crime while feeling complicit in it was a hallmark of later medieval audience engagement. In the wake of the vice gatherer, more salutary and still yet ambiguous, empathetic thief emerges on the early modern stage. There the gathering function no longer necessary to fund productions goes even farther underground. Its vestiges remain in asides and moments of direct address that enjoin audience complicity in ways that recall older communal fund funding models. So the final part of my talk will just um, focus on some of those early modern stage versions. It's called, uh, this section is called The Empathetic Thief on the Early Modern Stage. Familiar from games, ballads, and gathering rituals carrying his name, the ironic thief Robin Hood persisted on the early modern public stage. His character appeared in plays such as the anonymous Georgia Green, Peel's Edward I, and Monday and Shettles, The Downfall and Death of Robert Earl of Huntington. The empathetic thieves who populated the London stage lost the name of Robin Hood, but retained Robin's attractive guile. Like the late medieval vice, the empathetic thief drew audience wonder and a sense of complicity. Yet this character is not the later incarnation of the vice we see in Iago or Richard III. 
In Shakespeare's Henry IV, part one, the future King Henry is a robber. He appears early on in the play as a likable Hal, in part because he is portrayed as a thief. Through his exploits at Gadso with Falstaff, Hal falls in with a gang who filches purses and becomes, in that scene, identifiable for the audience. Thieves in early modern plays often are signaled as everymen, but they also bring various social elements in the plays together, connecting otherwise disparate sorts with their mobility. For example, in The Winter's Tale, Autolycus, labeled a snatcher up of unconsidered trifles, is a character who partially makes his living as a petty thief. Yet he serves as the central go-between who helps deliver the royal princess Perdita back to her father and connects the shepherds with the court. Thief characters serve the play's plots as they serve the play's communities by connecting disparate strands. With the cheekiness to speak and operate amongst all walks of life, they span social strata and reach the spectrum of socioeconomic sorts on the stage, including the audience. The London Prodigal of 1605 and Anthony Monday and Henry Chettle's Sir Thomas More at 1600 offer emblematic treatments of the empathetic thief. I've been suggesting that we trace the character's development through its formal features, primarily direct address. Of course, we must acknowledge that it is not direct address that defines the empathetic thief. After all, the villain who speaks directly to the audience is a stock figure in tragedy. And yet the criminal who invites viewer complicity survives intact on the early modern stage. Even the arguably detestable London prodigal character has the audience's ear. In this play, sometimes attributed to Shakespeare, Flowerdale, stealing from his own sister Delia, first, first speaks in an aside to the audience. He bookends his thieving in the scene by speaking in soliloquy, first confiding his plan, then concluding with a potentially empathy-building despair. Initially, he announces his intentions and his comic role as risk-taking adventure, surmising, I would I knew where to take a good purse, and concluding with his determination, by this light, I'll venture for it. Like stage prodigals such as Hal, he is expected to reform, yet his closing soliloquy to the scene takes an unexpected turn when he despairs. When money, means, and friends do grow so small, then farewell life, and there's an end of all. If meant to tug on the audience's heartstrings or to signal morality play like his path to redemption, Flowerdale's frank admission of his mistakes is not, however, a marker, a marker of moral shift. Like Shakespeare's thieves Autolycus and Falstaff before him, Flowerdale toggles between comical, almost farcical deception and something more human and pitiable. His later moments in the play are somewhat Faustus-like, where he embodies at once the role of vice and victim, hero and anti-hero. His own father sees him turned more devil than he was before. Yet just 200 lines later, Flowerdale's apologies are accepted. His repentances are taken at face value. He is forgiven by both father and wife, and the comedy ends with a feast and a full carouse. Whether his formulaic mouthing of repentance falls flat in comparison with the energetic confiding of his earlier schemes or the rudimentary prodigal son plot falls at its expe expected redemptive conclusion, the contrast is clear. The clever thief energizes the stage far more completely than does the reformed prodigal. And we find such another energizing figure who addresses the audience directly in the economic rogue in Monday and Chettle's Sir Thomas More, um, never performed. The play is notable for a scene recently determined to have been revised by Shakespeare. Though there's no evidence it was actually performed, it was sent to the master of the revels who demanded major revisions to the scene of a London insurrection that the then sheriff Thomas More helped to quell. The play depicts in this early scene, the play depicts the, this early scene in More's career in which he dispelled public tension and pursued leniency for foreign workers against whom citizens were rioting. Depicted as a practical man of the people, Moore befriends the local thief, Lifter, who is being prosecuted for his crimes. In the second scene, Moore directs a comic jest that exposes the hypocrisy of the punitive Justice Shursby, who seeks Lifter's execution. Moore asks Lifter, devise me but a means to pick or cut his purse, and on my credit, as I am a Christian and a man, I will procure thy pardon for that jest. Borrowing lingo from popular Coney catching pamphlets and jest books, Moore tells Lifter that he will be his setter. Setter here describes the decoy employed by criminals to set up a mark. Moore directs Lifter not to take the money for himself, but instead to give it to Moore so that it is a cunning act that credits him, Lifter. 
Lifter engages the audience directly, inviting them in on the heist, saying, silence their hope, as Shursby the mark comes on stage. Lifter takes Shursby's purse and exposes his folly in carrying a large sum, at the time seven pounds, a behavior Shursby had denounced in others as dangling fond bait to the needy. Lifter joins the other figures I have described, all risk-taking, venturing cut purses, part outlaw, part underdog, and always at the center of scenes carrying loads of dramatic tension. The Empathetic Thief then served a number of functions on the early modern stage, doing more than just reminding patrons of an earlier gathering role. Diachronic analysis accounting for the character's types varies in, the character types vary inception, the financial exigencies driving it, and its inflection across a number of genres offers a more accurate recognition of its genesis. It was the gatherer's bumptious engagement with donors that made possible the seemingly contradictory categories of thieving and attractiveness. When combined with evidence from the Ket and morality plays, this rough set of examples illuminates a tradition that carries that carried the gather dynamic onto the stage through subtle dramaturgical shifts. Central to the figure was a recognition of the common theatrical experience dependent upon the participation of audience members and surviving only with their support. One can trace a direct line from the gather's proximity to his donors through the morality play vices eliciting of complicity and thence to playmakers penning of empathetic thieves, ventures that demanded recognition for their efforts joined to that of players making a living on the early modern stage. This recognition would become as important to playing companies as the pence given to gathers had been to those earlier figures. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ingram. Um, I do want to say uh, someone commented already. Uh, uh, I believe your the cover of your book uh, was very much appreciated. Can you show it yet again? As I really, oh yes, that is nice. Did not get a chance to, oh, that is lovely. Just lovely. All right, so um, we have a question from uh, Max. So I think, um, I think you can just unmute yourself, Max, and ask ask away. Do I have to, Aaron, unmute him? No, okay, lovely. All right. Unmuted. Okay. Um, I'm intrigued. Thank you, Jill, for that. That was sparked all kinds of wonderful ideas. But the, the thing that I want to ask about is the, the sort of spectrum of uh, likability, morality, terror, that vices and demon demonic figures induce in the plays. The vices in mankind are frankly likable. You guys nowadays are naught. Um, they're not frightening. They're funny. They interrupt Mercy's really boring sermon at the beginning and we're on their side. Then we contribute to uh, the coming on of Tetivalus and we're implicated and at the end, Okay, Mercy comes on and Mercy's attitude has changed. And he, he now says, my, my heart to trimmeleth as the aspen leaf. And he's changed. And so we're with Mercy and we're ready to receive the Mercy. Those are amicable vices or amicable devils. Then there are the devils such as I've seen, for example, in Paramin Mountain in Port of Spain and Trinidad during Carnival, who are frightening and a cost the spectators. But when a drunk tries to intrude, a real genuine drunk tries to intrude and threaten the spectators, he is taken out of the way really quickly by the blue devils who then return to their threatening the, the audience. So they act as protective to the audience, in fact. Oh, wow. So again, there's a sympathy there and the locals know about this and they're not frightened. The third category I'm thinking of is the play, a play that I'm dealing with at the moment that I mentioned yesterday, but it's a Temptation of Antony play um, from the uh, uh, Alpine Provencal area in France, in, in Occitan. The devils in that that attack Antony and brutally attack, they enact a brutal attack. There is nothing in them that is sympathetic. Now it's possible that in performance, things would differ but in the actual reading of the text, 
I don't think for a moment that the, the audience is supposed to be frightened of the possibility of their own uh, giving in to the temptations of the demonic. So that if, if they become friendly, then the point of the play is lost. So you've got this whole range of uh, ways of reading and ways in, of enacting vice demons. And I'm wondering if you see that same range. I mean, the, the last two I've quoted are Carnival and a French play. But I'm wondering if you see that same range in the English drama that you're talking about. Whereas are there cases where the demons are not are not endearing and where our complicity is not invited. I'm thinking, for example, of Marlowe's Faustus. We do not want to yeah. end up at, at the end of Marlowe's Faustus going, oh, we've been complicit with the devil. Right. At the end of Mankind, we're quite happy to say, OK, we paid for Tertivolus to come on. We sang the naughty song, but it's OK because we're receiving mercy. Faustus doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think right. there are, there's a whole range of things. Yeah, that's interesting because the example I was thinking of before you mentioned it was was Faustus because, right, as you say, definitely at the at the end of the play, it is terribly frightening. You know, Faustus is being dragged down to hell. The devil is nothing that we would identify with, um, although we might identify with Faustus's identification <laughs> with the devil earlier in the play. And I think that your question really, to me, speaks to meta-dramatic issues. So um, we spectators, you know, identify with devils in a way, and it actually it actually ties back into the play No Fooling with Justice because we are talking about the return to the status quo, and I feel like this sort of jolly identification with evil is. Um, Meta is, is safe because meta dramatic and safe because there is a sense of that return to the status quo at the end of the play. And in fact, it's a meta dramatic moment that induces Faustus's own final commitment to evil when he watches the parade of the seven deadly sins, right? So he's induced into like a merry sense of, oh, you know, evil is delightful. This is so much fun. This is the kind of thing that I want to experience all the time because I, I'm identifying with all these sins. <laughs> um, and that's a joyful part in the play, but that is the thing that that gets him. And then, um, you know, by the by the sort of, you know, realistic end to his life um, is is frightening. But at least the instances I'm thinking of in English drama are their sort of joy and um, invitation to complicity with the vice are all um, wrapped within that sort of meta dramatic sense. We all know we're participating in this dramatic scene that will, in the end, affirm the punishment of, of vice. But I guess. Max, it also led me to question something that you brought up yesterday because it made me think of those theories of carnival. Um, you know, Bakhtin and I think you had, what was it, Eagleton, a quote from Eagleton and Greenblatt. And Alibar. And it was about um, what are these moments of, of folly and foolery and, and carnival, you know, lic licensed or not? And I actually had a question on, on what was your answer to that like how did those examples their theories not help us understand carnival i didn't say they don't help us understand carnival what i said is they don't help us understand medieval comedy got it okay because medieval comedy is is basically better understood by through the language of the magnificat he has put down the mighty from the seat raised up the uh, humble and meek so it's not that th those Discussions of carnival, I think, are helpful in furthering the discussion. I'm not sure I agree with any of them, but they're helpful in furthering the discussion uh, of carnival in a way that, but that doesn't work for medieval comedy. We, I was writing this article on comedy in the Middle Ages and politics and power, and in order to get to what medieval comedy was doing. I had to say it's not doing what you think it's doing if you've been raised on these theories of carnival. Do now, we you could think, go further, but I think that that'll do. 
Okay. Um, and I and I'll stop asking you questions. So if there are more questions for me, I can answer. But I did want to say, I mean, it to me that issue of raising the weak in the Magnificat. I mean, I see it tying into the way that I see these evil characters inviting, um, which I also link to the gathering function, you know, inviting identification with or empathy with um, their goings on, almost of saying, look, we are the outcasts. We are the weak characters in this society. Um, and we need to kind of use these tricksy methods to to not only get along, but to entertain you, you spectators. So and identify with us right now. But to me, that is like asking for an empathy for a weak, for a weak, a weakness, I guess. I think that we we are often invited to have an empathy with the characters as sinners, but not invited to have empathy with the characters as unrepentant demonic forces. <laughs> yeah, that's, fair, that's yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yep. Our uh, next and final speaker today um, and for the conference is Dr. Eric Schaus. He is an associate professor at East Carolina University. His research draws upon cultural studies and rhetoric to better understand the role of humor in popular culture. Dr. Schaus is in fact a stand-up comic and a professional joke writer his jokes have been uh, told on The Late Late Show and The B.O.B. B. or Bob and Tom Show. He's co-editor of The Dark Side of Stand-Up Comedy, published by Palgrave Macmillan uh, just last year, 2020. He has also published uh, in, uh, works in Humor, uh, International Journal of Humor Research, uh, Studies in American Humor, the Israeli Journal of Humor Research, comedy studies, and text and performance quarterly. <laughs> He's currently working very hard thinking and writing about the rhetorical structures that invite laughter. Whereas you have squandered your valuable time and energy hearing his, yeah, yes, his biography, sorry. I blew the, the line. Professor Schaus is speaking today on a brief history of the American Outlaw comic. Professor Schuss. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, thank you for having me, everybody. I, uh, like uh, Jill, I'm going to be talking about the direct address of criminal characters. Uh, you might know them as stand-up comics. Uh, but I'm gonna begin with uh, two stories uh, about Alexander the Great. Uh, the first story many of you may have heard about before is a story that took place between Alexander and the philosopher Diogenes. Uh, legend has it that young Alexander sought out Diogenes because the fame and reputation of the philosopher had made him curious. And Alexander found Diogenes taking a sun bath to display his good nature and his generosity. Alexander supposedly said, good afternoon. I am the great Alexander. I can offer you anything in this world. What is your heart's desire? And Diogenes replied, you can stop blocking my son. Most of us love this sort of story. And by us, I mean folks who think it's a great idea to spend a day listening to scholarly talks about medieval history. How could we not? It's a story of intelligence and wit triumphing over power. This is the song of our people. Now let me tell you a different story about Alexander. Alexander had been playing ball and having himself anointed. He had the young man in his company rub his new body with oil as one does after a sweaty game with one's youthful compatriots. And just as he was going to begin getting dressed again, the young men with him saw a stranger sitting upon the king's throne. The king's men approached the stranger and began to ask him questions. And the man explained that he had been in prison for a long time, that there the god Serapis had come to him and told him that he should go and assume the king's throne as he had done. Alexander had that man killed. I know, kind of an abrupt ending, isn't it? But that is how power actually works in more situations than not. This tale of Diogenes and Alexander shows that the story of the wise fool and the king was popular long before the Middle Ages. However, in medieval culture, stories of wise fools challenging authority were raised to the level of myth. 
Both literature and folk culture of the period are replete with tales of comic types who avoid punishment despite challenging the powerful thanks to luck or wit or a combination of the two. And why not? I mean, there's something wonderfully hopeful about searching for moments of freedom in comic rebellion. My intent in my talk today is not to reject this mythology. It's merely to offer a complementary mythology. And my complementary myth is this, that the clown is so often painted on his smile because he's been kicked in the teeth. Personal anecdote. I was performing stand-up comedy at a place called Coconuts Comedy Club in St. Pete Beach. It's about 15 years ago. And it was one of the first times that I absolutely killed it. I felt fantastic. And there was a moment in my set where I paused. And the laughter, there's a woman who sat right down front and she, she shouted out, oh my God, I'm going to pee. 100 people in the room all hear this simultaneously. And I said, that would be awesome. I can go home and tell my wife that I got another woman wet. The crowd erupts. <laughs> they, they, they lose it, right? I float off the stage after that performance. That night. It was one of the best feelings I've had as a young performer. I go outside and I'm standing there and a guy comes up to me and he is a mountain of a human being. He's got to be six foot six. And he reaches out his hand to shake my hand. And he says, I just want you to know you was real funny. It were the words that he said, right? But what his hand said to me was, I just want you to know that I am the king and you are the jester and the king can kill the jester anytime he wants. Now, obviously I'm not the only comedian who's ever told a joke to the wrong person, right? In 1949, Milton Burrow was the highest paid comedian in the country. As the host of the Texas Star Theater, he earned over $700,000 a year, more than some college professors. But unlike Uncle Milty, uh, Uncle Milty did not get there without paying his dues. One evening during his rise to fame, Milton Burrow made the mistake of angering Jewish mobster Louis Pretty Amberg at a show in Las Vegas. Later that night, Amberg expressed his displeasure about the jokes by picking up a fork. According to Milton Burrow, he jabbed the fork in his chin, right? Like a, you would use an ice pick. Fortunately for the young comedian, there was another mobster there named Marty Crompier who stepped in, grabbed the fork out of the hand, and according to, to Bert, uh, to Burrow, Crompier pushed him into the street, pushed him into a cab, gave the driver a name of the doctor that some of the local boys had on call, and he wound up getting eight stitches, two for every prong of the, the, the fork. Talk about a comedian taking it on the chin. That's a bad joke. That's so bad. <laughs> I'm glad I met in front of you. <laughs> As a few comedians from this era learned the hard way, it was important never to challenge the honor of the mob and its associates. And in that respect, the comedians from the 1940s and 1950s in the United States were not entirely dissimilar from comedians in medieval France. In Laughing Matters, Farce from the Making of Absolutism in France, Sarah Beam suggested that in medieval France, Members of the nobility never hesitated to lash out physically at men who insulted their family name or questioned their military prowess. And nobles could be forgiven for such acts, even for murder, if they could justify them as necessary to defend their honor, or as the mafia likes to call it, respect. Who knew that the French nobility and the, the Middle Ages would have so much in common with American mobsters? In today's talk, I'm gonna explain how the relationship between stand-up comics and authorities has been eerily akin to the relationship between the fools and authorities of the Middle Ages. The thesis of my talk is very straightforward. I believe that the, uh, their, like their medieval predecessors, stand-ups have both skirted authority and been punished by the authorities. And that whether the fool avoids punishment or takes it on the chin is a matter of chance or luck or fate or whatever synonym, synonym one might use to suggest that Einstein was wrong when he said that God doesn't play dice with the universe. As I've hinted, stand-up comedy began in the United States as part of a front for criminal activity. With the repeal of prohibition, the mafia's vast network of illegal speakeasies became quote unquote legitimate nightclubs. Many of these clubs provided their patrons with comedy and light entertainment in the front of the house, 
while offering less uh, legitimate diversions in their back rooms and their basements. The stranglehold of the mafia on the nightclub scene was such that as a practical matter, virtually everyone who performed stand-up comedy in the post-prohibition -pro era worked for the mob. In fact, Dick Curtis, a comedian who performed regularly in nightclubs during this era, believes that uh, the mafia coined the term stand-up comic. You see, in the mob-run fight, uh, fight business, a stand-up fighter was a man who could be counted on to take and deliver a punch. Likewise, a stand-up comic was expected to take on sometimes hostile audiences and keep on punching. The influence of the mafia in the early days of stand-up created a situation in which many comedians had to navigate both the long arm of the law and the brass knuckles of the mob. For example, Joey Lewis was a singer and comedian who made the mistake of crossing his employer, machine gun Jack McGurn. The name should have been a hint. As retribution for performing at a rival nightclub, McGurn had three of his associates pay Lewis a visit. They beat him to a pulp, cut his throat, left his tongue hanging by a string. It took three years for Joey Lewis to learn how to speak again. Despite his lengthy convalescence, however, Lewis refused to inform on the men who had cut his face open and ended his singing career. And his silence earned him the respect of every mob outfit in the United States. As a result, from 1935 until his death in 1971, Joey Lewis was the comedian at the forefront of the mob's nightclub network. That's how the mob uh, rewarded a comedian by, for being a stand-up guy. However, even if a stand-up managed to successfully navigate the dangers presented by working for the mob, he or she could still wind up in hot water with the legitimate authorities. It happened to some of the best and the worst of them. Speaking of the worst, probably the most famous blue comic of the post-war era was a guy by the name of B.S. Pulley. Milton Berle called him a legend in the annals of filth. The name B.S. did not stand for Boy Scout. Rodney Dangerfield, who performed with Pulley early in his career, said, I'd heard plenty about B.S. Pulley before I met him. People said he was a low-class, filthy, dirty maniac. When I met Pulley, I realized uh, they'd all been too nice. Pulley was arrested in Greenwich Village in 1942 and jailed for indecency. He was detained until someone arrived with a $500 for bail. That's a little over $8,000 in today's money. It's a pretty heavy fine for some jokes. However, like the French nobility, the law in New York was fickle. When Pulley was arrested again in 1946 and put on trial for obscenity, a grand jury refused to indict him. Now, I want you to know, I love stand-up comedy. I'm a huge proponent of free speech, but the grand jury might have got it wrong in Pulley's case. Pulley didn't only tell crude jokes. He also loved a sight gag. According to comedian Freddie Roman, Pulley would do things on stage that would get him canceled today. One night, Pulley walked up behind a young woman who was singing on stage and grabbed her breasts. The audience laughed and the girl ran off stage crying. And then that's not enough. He was known for walking around with a cigar box by down by his crotch and he'd say, hey lady, do you want a cigar? Only that was no cigar. I know, it's pretty gross. I mean, what kind of person would do something like that? I, I can't imagine. Oops. Yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. How about we shift to someone we can actually celebrate from this period? Belle Barth established herself in the 1940s in the Catskill Roadhouses. Um, some of you may have heard of the Catskills before, also known as the Borscht Belt. I, the reference is usually to well-known comedians who played to rising middle class who summered in resorts in upstate New York. These acts were clean. Barth was not. Let me give you a quick taste of Catskills Roadhouse comedy. A story about two men who went hunting. One was a little cross-eyed hunter. Shot off a shotgun. The shotgun scatters, and the other guy got hit right in the kidroom. It's Italian for cucumber. He had nine holes in it. He ran to the doctor. The doctor got scared. He said, I think I'll send you the Schwartz. The guy said, who's Schwartz? A specialist? The doctor said, no, he's a piccolo player. I'll show you how to finger it. <laughs>
Bill Barth was arrested for staging an obscene show in 1953, in 1954, and in 1955, pulling off the rare obscenity hat trick. In, uh, in, in her first album, If I Embarrass You, Tell Your Friends, was banned in New York City. It's as though the authorities had learned nothing from prohibition. The best way to make people want something is to tell them they can't have it. Barth sold 300,000 copies of her album. She was wonderfully unapologetic. After an arrest in Buffalo for disorderly conduct, she said, if it's breaking the law to make people laugh, well, then I'm guilty. My absolute favorite story about Belle Barth happened in 1964 when she was performing in Miami Beach. Two female school teachers went to see her perform. Not surprisingly, they were offended. They sued Barth for $1.6 million claiming that the performance corrupted them morally. I guess neither of them had ever played the piccolo. The police regularly arrested comedians like Foley and Barth throughout the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s for ill-defined crimes against decency. For example, burlesque comic Jimmy Savile was arrested in 1942 after the Catholic theater movement complained about a performance. Comedians Mickey Diamond, Jack High, and Marty Wayne were arrested for obscenity in 1946 in Philadelphia. The judge in Wayne's case called his material an affront to public morals and sentenced him to six months in prison on the charge of lewd entertainment. And in 1949, Lenny Ross was arrested in Atlantic City on charges of quote unquote being smutty. As if page 19 of the criminal code said no smut. They just made up the laws <laughs> just to punish these guys. In addition for, to the bus for indecency, moral crusaders in the 1950s began to in, uh, investigating the influence of the mob in the nightclub and the entertainment industry. And many of these investigators wound up dead. As Lenny Bruce joked, the Chicago was the only city where death certificates listed the cause of death as he wouldn't listen. I want to point out that the joke I just shared with you is a different sort of humor from what I've discussed so far. B.S. Poli and Bell Barth told a lot of the kind of jokes you might find in a joke book if you ever saw an old joke book. Lenny Bruce was one of the first stand-up comics to do improvised social satire based on his lived experience. As a result, Lenny Bruce became the quintessential outlaw American comic. He was a truth teller who made his way through life by skirting the regulations other people lived by. After being kicked out of the Navy for performing for his fellow soldiers in a dress, Lenny Bruce was in Florida with his stripper girlfriend, Hot Honey Harlow. Isn't that a wonderful sentence? <laughs> Lenny was looking for a way to supplement his income as a comedian, so he went door to door dressed as a priest, collecting money for a leper colony. When the police confronted him as he was leaving a well-to-do elderly woman's house, a standoff commenced between Father Lenny and the cops. As more police arrived, so did more elderly ladies who had come to love the good father Lenny. When the police demanded that Lenny come with them, one of the elderly ladies cried out, if you don't wanna, we're behind you, father. <laughs> Lenny was eventually taken in and charged with vagrancy and panhandling. But when the police went to his hotel room, they found all of Lenny's brochures for the very real leper colony. This was a well thought out scam. His convoluted story about being both a stand-up comic and the leader of a charity or a charitable organization was so confusing, the police fought, forgot to question why he was dressed as a priest. In three days in Florida, Lenny Bruce collected $8,000. He eventually sent the leper colony $2,500 and kept, kept $5,500 for himself for expenses, which I think was very Catholic of him. Bruce was arrested for obscenity for the first time in October 4th, 1961 at the Jazz Workshop in San Francisco after using the word cocksucker. That word was heard at the time almost as infrequently as it is today at medieval studies conferences. Lenny was found not guilty in that particular case. However, the incident brought the comedian to the attention of the authorities. As his fame grew, so did the degree to which they monitored his, both his on and his offstage behavior. That probably wouldn't have been such a hardship except for the fact that Lenny was a degenerate heroin, heroin junkie. Over the course of the next five years until his death in 1966 from morphine uh, overdose, Bruce was arrested on obscenity and drug charges on a regular basis. 
He was found not guilty of most of the obscenity charges or had them overturned on appeal. However, in 1964, he was arrested twice in the same week for obscenity at the Cafe Agogo in Greenwich Village. He was found guilty that later that year and sentenced to, sentenced to four months in a workhouse. Fortunately for him, Lenny died before the sentence could be imposed. Four months in a workhouse would have killed him. Although his stand-up doesn't hold up very well, Lenny Bruce is revered by many contemporary stand-up comics as a champion of free speech. Lenny Bruce became the archetype for future hard-partying, rule-breaking, vulgar comic outlaws. While early stand-up comics like B.S. Poli and Bell Barth pushed the envelope in terms of their uh, language, Bruce was at the vanguard of a new style of comedy. Where previous stand-ups tended to wear tuxedos and ball gowns and tell stock jokes, Lenny Bruce improvised comedy based on his personal experiences. As Charles L. Mead Jr. wrote in the New York Times in 1965, the new comedians not only wrote their own jokes, but they were expected to live them off stage as well as on. Perhaps no stand-up comic better illustrates the shift in stand-up from light entertainment to a significant form of cultural criticism than George Carlin. His 1972 album, FM and AM, incorporated the sort of straight-laced material he had previously been known for on the AM side with his new, more political hippie aesthetic on the FM side. That new counterculture point of view got him in a lot of trouble that year, as in 1972, he was arrested for obscenity at Milwaukee Summerfest for performing his soon to be infamous routine, Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television. About 35,000 people were on the grounds as he took the stage and began taking digs at the Vietnam War, the drug laws, and the church. Then Carlin started to talk about those seven words you can never say on TV. He made it far enough into the bit to say those seven words twice before a Milwaukee police officer, Elmer Lentz, who was on the grounds for another show with his wife and nine-year-old child, left his family to find a payphone. According to Lentz, I couldn't believe my ears. I couldn't see why nobody was doing nothing about it. Lentz called his commanding officer and described the scene. Permission was granted to arrest Carlin upon the completion of his show. After 30 minutes of his, going 30 minutes over his allotted time, Carlin thanks the audience, and then he takes a kind of surreptitious route off the stage uh, so he could ditch the baggie of cocaine he had in his front pocket. After a few hours in jail, Carlin was freed on $150 bail, and on, on October 4, sorry, December 14, 1972, the case goes to trial. Carlin wasn't in the courtroom, but he'd sent a copy of his album, Class Clown, Right? And both the prosecution and the defense agreed that it was an acceptable approximation of the performance that he had given at Summerfest. There was audible laughter in the courtroom as the record played. Even the judge was observed chuckling. And shortly after, the judge dismissed the charges. Although Carlin was the last famous comedian arrested for using dirty words, he was by no means the last comedian arrested. Take, for example, Jack Roy. The official story Jack Roy told everyone about his comedy career was one of perseverance. Supposedly after struggling to make for years in the business, Jack's wife pressured him to get a steady day job. Jack acquiesced and took a job selling aluminum siding. He later joked that his early years in comedy were so miserable that when he quit, he was the only one who knew that he quit. To avoid the stigma from his earlier failed comedy career, when Jack said that when he returned to comedy, he changed his name to Rodney Dangerfield. And that was the story that he told everyone, right? Because Jack Roy got no respect, no respect at all. But here's the real story. Jack Roy had to give up selling aluminum siding after he was arrested by the FBI in a conspiracy that included faking $600,000 in home repair loans. Somehow, Rodney managed to avoid the conviction, but his career in aluminum siding sales was completely kaput which is the real reason he got back into stand-up comedy full-time. The stand-up comic who took the style of truth-telling personal improvisational comedy that took off in the 1960s to its zenith, some of you are probably familiar, was Richard Pryor. Pryor actually credited Lenny Bruce with inspiring his transition to a more confrontational style of comedy in the 1960s. Although Pryor was never arrested for obscenity, he too had quite a few run-ins with various authorities, including the mob. Let's hear him talk about that. I worked at a mafia nightclub. 
I was in Youngstown, Ohio. I was 19. I was 19 years old, right? And I didn't know shit about the mafia. Uh, my father was the baddest motherfucker I'd ever seen. So the mafia didn't mean shit to me. I did not relate to the mafia. <laughs> and I worked with this lady, Satin Doll. She was the star of the show. Beautiful black stripper, right? Because usually in those days, they had like, in, in clubs, they had a singer and a stripper and MC. I was the MC. And she was the first black star I ever met. Satin Doll. Yeah, because Duke Ellington had written a tune about her. You know, that's what she used to dance to and act. She was beautiful. She was 60 then. Oh, this bitch was firing though, man. I'm not lying. Nina Horn didn't have shit on her. And she was crying backstage. You know, I got to get the buffalo. They won't pay me. I said, who won't pay you? Club owners won. I said, oh, they're not going to pay me. Bet, bet. And I, now this is how ignorant I was. I had a cap pistol. You know them blank starter pistols? I busted into the office with this motherfucker in my All right, give me the money, motherfucker. Doing my best black shit, you know. You know, that shit usually scare Whitey to death. And these motherfuckers didn't do nothing. And I'm sure that those men are sitting in that room today laughing. Because that's what this dude, he just started laughing. <laughs> this fucking kid. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, Tony, come here. Come here, Rich, do the bell again. Hey, Tony, come here. Stick up. <laughs> this fucking kid, come here. Come here, this fucking kid. He's got a pack of gooses on him. Ah! Fucking dick him here. They like to hug you and rub you. Yeah, fuck. Yeah. And grab your face. You've got the mamoos in there. Ah. This fucking dick got some gooses. They move. And they always say shit you don't understand. <laughs> hey, you want a little cuisine with only? Hey, Pilo, fix him a little bit on the side. Put some screws on. Huh? Fry it up. They like fried foods. Fucking get, I ain't coming in. They come in here, they're trying to fucking get, uh, move your business like that. Uh. Pay everybody off, pay everybody. It's all right, it's what I have done. They paid everybody off, let everybody go, kept me. I'm like a pet. <laughs> they kept me like a pet. <laughs> yeah, working for the mafia could be a little scary. Uh, as Richard Pryor explained in the early days of stand-up, comedians would often work as MCs in burlesque shows. In the 1960s and 1970s, opportunities to perform in coffee houses and alternative establishments opened up. But stand-up really took off in the 1980s. Full-time comedies opened up where they're around the world where freedom of speech was a given rather than the exception. But stand-up still attracted outlaws. As comedian Adrian Tulse said, Coke was everywhere in the clubs. In the early 1980s, you could go down to the basement and catch a rising star, and there was a fluorescent light fixture, and tucked inside it were little half grams of Coke and a straw for you to use. Nick's Comedy Stop in Boston used to pay headliners part in cocaine and part in cash. And some clubs tried to pay their, their, uh, their con comedians entirely in cocaine. When this happened to comedian Billy Rybeck one night, he was indignant. He told the club owner, it's not like I can go to Ralph's grocery store and go, hey, I'd like the veal chops. Here's some Coke. Ryback told the guy to pay him in cash or he was going to call the cops and the, the uh, owner uh, eventually relented. It was during this era that a group of comedians that called themselves the Texas Outlaw Comics first formed. The group mostly came out of the Comedy Workshop Comedy Club in Houston, Texas. Some of its best known members included Bill Hicks, Ron Schock, and Carl LeBeau. In 1980, Kinnison and Hicks planned a big move to LA. Kinnison borrowed money and rented out an 1100 seat theater in downtown Houston for a fundraising event for their big move to the coast. He called the, the uh, event Outlaw Comics on the Lamb. When Sam managed to sell only 80 tickets, he left town in a hurry, owing a lot of people money, making him an actual outlaw comic on the lamb. He managed to uh, finally make it to LA by working as an itinerant preacher. 
Unlike Lenny Bruce, Sam had been raised in the church and was at least uh, a somewhat legitimate Pentecostal preacher. The thing about the Texas Outlaws was that whatever rules you would put up in front of them, they generally try and find a way around them. One of my favorite stories about Sam Kinison happened one night when they were, uh, the Outlaws were partying in a hotel room after hours. They ran out of alcohol after last call and the, uh, the proprietor of the hotel refused to accommodate them. So Sam figured out a solution to the problem. He called up a limo company and he said, yeah, does, does that limo come with a fully stocked bar? And it did, so he had to come over. And he went down, cleared all the liquor out of the limo, gave the driver a huge tip and told him to go home. He said the party never has to stop. Sometimes stand-ups are forced to become outlaws. In 1995, Earthquake, a black, popular black comic from Atlanta, was hired by a Fort Wayne, Indiana city councilman. And after the show, the councilman said, you can come by my office tomorrow and pick up your check. Cue to the next morning, after keeping Earthquake and his fellow comics waiting for three hours, the councilman's secretary says, oh, I'm sorry, he seems to have left town. Earthquake was like, well, we're gonna get paid one way or the other. He goes, we just started taking all the shit out of his office. We snatched computers, plaques, even pictures of the councilman's kids. They piled all that in the limo and they're headed to the airport when they get stopped by the police. Earthquake explains the situation. They drive to the police station where remarkably the councilman who was supposed to be out of town has appeared and is now has a check cut for them for $3,000 and they're able to leave town. That story makes you wonder who's the real outlaw. Earthquake and his com fellow comedians are the shady councilman who tried to, to rip them off. The final story I want to uh, tell you calls this into question as well. It was told to me by a comedian, Bruce Baum, after we performed together one night. Uh, according to Bruce, the, the cops in Cleveland were fantastic. The cops used to come to the shows. They'd give him a little slip of paper when he got to town that said, if Bruce is drunk, don't throw him in jail. Just take him back to the hotel, right? And so after a show one night, he's partying with some people. One of them was a cop. And he goes, we all decided to smoke a little herb. He's a comic of the 1970s. They called it herb. And uh, he says, we're smoking. The cop is smoking with us. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door, right? And in walks another cop. So the first cop hides in a closet, right? The second cop is standing there and with his friends and he's like really awkward for about 10 minutes. We're trying to be hide the pot and like, uh, hope he finally after about 10 minutes, the second cop, he leaves. And the first cop pokes his head out of the closet. He's like, is he gone? <laughs> so it was pretty weird having a cop hide from another cop. Uh, so in conclusion today, uh, this is what I, I can tell you anything, it's this, power is fickle and identities are uncertain. Comics are sometimes outlaws, authorities are sometimes outlaws, and outlaws are sometimes comic. And as Bill Hicks once said, life is a dream and we are all the imagination of ourselves. Thanks. Thank you. That was absolutely delightful and very, very uh, educational. I have to say. Um, I want to, at this point, thank uh, uh, Professor Schaus and uh, Professor Ingram. And I do have um, some uh, uh, just uh, concluding remarks. So I have a little PowerPoint here and a little mini one. And I will share screen. And we will conclude. So, all right. I never could have imagined when I conceived of this conference five years ago, the hurdles I would have to leap over just to see it to fruition, that I'd be unable to host my speakers and show them hospitality for their fine, really fine scholarly efforts. Then when it became clear we'd not be able to perform uh, the play live, my husband and I would have to find a way over many months following uh, the exigencies of COVID protocols to get the actors' lines on camera and turn the bits and pieces into the a film. I'm glad we persisted. I'm amazed at how it all came together. I never supposed I would be witness to document after document using my own fanciful, but rather accurate turn of phrase, uh, contrasting and comparing folly with justice in the daily news. And this is just within 
the past year. These are but a few I took note of. I'm still shocked. I could never have dreamed that I would be confronted with an unprecedented spectacle of folly in the halls of government, if not of justice per se, of my own country, and that I would see fellow citizens overrunning sober legislative chambers in the most fool adjacent guises and using the most luridly rule breaking of means, I remain stunned. And it's almost stupefying to hear this very week from those who have anguished over the madness of loved ones lost unjustly. One mother, uh, that is Gwen Carr, acknowledging the recent verdict just this week with the words, finally, I get a glimmer of justice. As our speakers have eminently demonstrated, the engagement of folly and justice goes back a long way. The results of this engagement, as we've heard, have been buried. Some considered fools or madmen or operating outside the law as ordinary folk or as performers continue to sidestep the law, yet justice itself has been castigated for not following its own set paths to equity in the affairs of humankind. Here in the United States, we have our own modern fools, kind of fools, sort of fools, stand-up comics such as Lewis Black, Dave Chappelle, and Hal Sparks, who while not outlaws of comedy, as we have heard, are certainly iconoclastic, ardent, enraged, even seemingly maddened critics of the rot and injustice at the heart of many of the social, political, and religious matters in current culture. There is a kind of folly, even though it may not involve fools per se, that inspire and redeems and will not, unlike with our poor astonished fools of yore, be co-opted. May such redemptive folly give belly laughs to us all. Finally, I want to express my gratitude to all the scholars who contributed their good work these past two days. My deep thanks go to the good people of UCLA's Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, Brett, Aaron, Karen, Benet, and Director Sarinka for their efforts at making this conference come together. A big shout out of thanks go to all of my presenters. Um, I have to say they not only produced excellent scholarship under these most uh, extraordinary of circumstances, but you hung in there while we uh, sorted out if and when and under what circumstances this conference could ever take place. My deepest appreciation to my hardworking cohort in crime, my husband, Kurt Steingler, who directed and put together the film and helped with the tech portion of my presentations. I hope our efforts have been a benefit to all who have been witness to this gathering of minds. I wish you all health and happiness as we go our separate ways. Thank you very much.